Hello and welcome to the Sheldrake Vernon Dialogues with myself, Mark Vernon, and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi, Rupert. Hello, Mark. We get together um, every so often and have a discussion about something we've been thinking about, wrestling with, um, turning over the ideas of, um, partly for our own interest, but also hopefully to spark thoughts um, in you as well, and maybe even initiate other conversations. It'd be lovely to think that went on. And Rupert, um, what I was wondering about today is to think about death. And my reason for thinking about death is that just a couple of weeks ago, I was involved with a, an organization called Doctors in Distress, which is a charity that looks after doctors, particularly their mental health and nurses and other medical practitioners. And where we are in the current COVID pandemic, um, you know, over a year on now, um, one of the things that came across really powerfully was that doctors are feeling that all the anxiety and concern about death is being outsourced onto the medical profession. And it's too much. And it's, it's directly contributing, contributing to the sense of burnout um, and um, exhaustion and, and even you know, mental health problems that medics of one sort or another themselves face as well. Now, clearly, you know, on the medical side, you want to go to a medic when you're thinking about illness and what to do about it. But their point was that people show up in surgeries with a whole lot more than just the physical complaint. And we live in a culture, it seems, that seems to have lost touch with a lot of the resources for trying to think about death in the round, because of course it's a psychological and a spiritual um, and emotional, it's a, it's a, you know, it's one of the big issues of life, of course. So I was wondering whether we might think about that. Um, but also I know, to hand over to you, that you've been thinking about death, maybe in a very different context, it seems, but I wonder whether there's relevance because by thinking about death in different contexts, we maybe get ideas that we can draw on um, to think about it for what it means ourselves, culturally and individually. Yes. Well, I've been thinking about death in all sorts of contexts recently, partly because my brother, my only sibling, died about a month ago. And so that, of course, brought the issue to my mind very much so, as well as all the deaths uh, are going on around us through COVID and other causes. Um, well, this is also something I've been thinking about in a strictly biological sense. Um, some work I did years ago at Cambridge when I was working on plant development um, gave me a, a new way of thinking about death in relation to life. And basically um, what I found was, and what I've recently been writing about in technical papers for botanical journals, is that within plants the death of cells is part of normal life. And as the cells die, they, their contents break down. And one of the breakdown products of cell death is indolacetic acid, a chemical derivative of tryptophan, which is one of the amino acids. And this is known as auxin. It's the main plant hormone. So the main plant hormone that stimulates growth, new development, the formation of roots, um, and uh, the differentiation of wood cells um, is produced by dying cells. Uh, so the hormone that gives more growth and more life is produced by death within the plant. And the main cells that die um, in a growing plant are the wood cells. The wood cells are the tubes that conduct water from the roots to the shoots. And in the wood of a tree, there's lots and lots of them. Um, the, the conducting it up to the shoot system and within the veins of leaves all the veins are made of vascular tissue which contains xylem or wood cells and phloem cells which are tubes that conduct sugars out of the leaf to growing parts of the plant. So uh, this is something I discovered when I was doing my PhD and it's something I've returned to because it's um, now the conditions in plant science are such that 
this fits with so much recent evidence that um, it's the, all it's like a key to a pattern falling into place. Um, basically, the formation of a hormone stimulating growth and life through death shows that death and life are totally interdependent. And the same is true in our own bodies. I mean, our skin cells die, our blood cells die, our intestinal lining cells die, and they're continually replaced by stem cells uh, dividing and giving new cells. But death is part of life in animals and plants. In embryonic growth in animals, many cells die, and they undergo what's called programmed cell death. Um, and in plants, the cells that die, um, that give nutrients and hormones that stimulate new growth are not only in the wood cells, they're also in the nutritive tissues of the seeds. The endosperm uh, is the storage tissue in a seed that breaks down and uh, to feed the growing seedling. Um, and that dies, uh, releases what stimulates new growth. And actually, um, there's a remarkable crossover from that to a kind of spiritual consideration of death because in one of Jesus's sayings he says unless the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies you know you can't have new life so he explicitly ties the botanical death and life I mean he didn't talk in terms of the endosperm and these uh, tissues that we now talk about but the basic principle is very clear and explicit that there's, there has to be death in order to release new life. And this is certainly true if you look uh, in the ecological context as well. If organisms went on living indefinitely, there'd be no space for new one, new life or uh, for evolution to occur. Death has to happen. Um, it's an inevitable part of the process of life. Um, even in, in single-celled organisms, um, some of the cells die, otherwise the world would be overwhelmed with amoebas and bacteria and stuff. Um, so I think that helps seeing the context, that it's, it's not some kind of medical disaster, uh, it's an inevitable part of life, and in fact all traditional cultures have recognized that. Um, that's why they all have rites of passage for death and why the ancestors are honored in most cultures because they're considered uh, to influence the living even from uh, after they're dead. Um, uh, the death and the dead and the living are interconnected and interlinked both at the biological cellular level at the ecological level and also in the human societal level and of course at the most simple straightforward financial way you know when parents die and their children inherit their wealth if they have any um, there's this regenerative passing on of um, assets from generation to generation so it's, it has a kind of stimulatory and regenerative effect and I think that the, the, the one reason that we're in the position where people don't relate to it in the way they used to is because of the predominance of materialism and atheism. Um, secular uh, materialism says that when you die, that's the end. Your brain just decays, your mind's nothing but your brain, your brain decays, you, you go blank. So life, there's only one life, and when you die, that's it. Um, and there's nothing much more to be said. Um, then life becomes super precious and rather than a stage in a process. And I think that the hospice movement, um, which was started by Cicely Saunders and was with, with, with a, definitely with a religious basis to it, um, treats death as a natural process. And that is one of the things that plays into the practical dealings with death. Um, and I don't know how much doctors are trained in palliative care and hospice type environments, uh, certainly some are because there are palliative care specialists, um, but I think what we've had through the triumphs of mechanistic medicine is the assumption that medicine's potentially all-powerful and the people who believe in transhumanistic life extension believe that we can overcome death 
through uh, medical and technical means and indeed the communists thought that I mean they thought that they could revive Lenin from his mausoleum and that death would be overcome through science rather than a death being overcome in a spiritual sense through religious traditions so I think we're the, the, in a modern secular context there's a terrible muddle about it yeah and it makes a lot of sense to me that um, that death has come to be seen at worst as a kind of bookend to life that's kind of unavoidable but perhaps with this kind of fantasy that it can be overcome in the extent in the sense of just extending life indefinitely um and i think that's actually a real tension in the medical profession that there are parts of the medical profession like palliative care that have a different approach to death and realize that death is a stage in life that people enter and then can be helped with um, through palliative care. But I think that the, the dominant um, attitude in the medical profession is shaped by the Hippocratic Oath, which of course is a good thing, but it's broadly to keep life going as long as possible. Um, but when someone's in the dying stage of their life, that can become very counterproductive. And of course it then gets, um, into trouble with bureaucracy and legal threats and so on. Um, for a doctor to say, I'm gonna help someone to die is a very loaded remark to make. Um, and so I think it is a real tension actually in the medical profession that is part of this buildup of the pressure. But I also, you know, really warm to what you're saying there about how it's understood in spiritual traditions, because, um, you know, if I've understood you're right, it's not saying that um, death is something um, to be kind of wiped away, whether that be through medical intervention or indeed kind of spiritual magic almost, the kind of miracle that death is nothing at all. Um, it's actually to say that death and life are deeply interwoven and that even in some way you don't know about life until you also know about death. I think that there's something very profound about those two aspects coming together I mean, I think about it particularly, say, in relation to um, uh, Plato's dialogue, the Phaedo, which is the dialogue that Plato wrote in which Plato, in which Socrates dies. I mean, it's it's very fascinating to read because you know that by the end of this dialogue, and it's not a big dialogue, it only takes maybe an hour or two to read, um, Socrates is going to be dead. And the challenge, in a way, that Plato sets up um, in the participants in this dialogue and then also with us readers is can we approach this death virtually for us actually for them and see more of life can, because we're approaching death and not because we're turning our back on death not because we're saying we don't believe death's the end um, i mean what happens in the dialogue is that plato systematically almost undermines the assumptions that um, are aired in the dialogue, you know, like death is just the, 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 so the prison, the body is just a prison of the soul. And that's a common phrase attributed to Plato as if Plato didn't really care about dying because the body is just a prison of the soul and he thought his soul would float off. And, um, you know, to my mind, that's a complete misunderstanding of the Phaedo. What Plato is trying to do is raise these things that people say and show how they can't be right in themselves. And so the dialogue completely, sort of encourages you to come closer and closer to the starkness of death and let go of everything that you're holding on to that might make you avoid the reality of death. But the point is then to see what's left, what can't be, as it were, undone by death. And it's an experiential thing. You know, you can't, it's, this is not about proof. It's about feeling and seeing, which is in a way why I think that the work you're talking about in the biological world and the plant world is a sort of spiritual practice actually because it's about approaching death in one organism and feeling how that relates to you as another organism um it, it's it's consciousness expanding not just kind of studying something um and what plato concludes which i think is common actually with many wisdom traditions it's there in christianity i think it's there in indian philosophies um for sure um that life actually contains death if you like um it's not that death contains life um as if um something because something can't contain nothing um to hark back to another conversation we've had um, only something can hold on to its negation um and so there's this experiential realization that 
through death we actually discover more life but it is through death it's not by avoiding by wishing it away by proving that it doesn't really exist which i think is another thing that goes on quite a lot in religious traditions now you know as if you can turn to the bible and prove that jesus was resurrected um, and therefore that kind of gives you an objective um reassurance that there's life beyond death i think that misunderstands things that what really the christian tradition and other traditions are about is really going through death and discovering that there's more life um, and now this will happen to us at the end of our, our lives of course as you're saying as well and with your brother particularly you've just experienced that um, with him but i think it can be something that we can incorporate into our lives now which is what the spiritual traditions would encourage us to do as well whether that be by contemplating death by studying death in various ways, by noticing how life actually is a constant process of letting go to let more in as well. Um, anyway, that, anyway, that's just to say this feels like a hugely rich area and it's very fascinating that both wisdom traditions properly understood, but even scientific study can be used to uh, re-nurture some of these insights um, for us now, which seems so necessary. Well, I think one of the reasons it's so necessary for us now is that in the past, people were very familiar with death. I mean, it's, in the Victorian period, families on the whole were large, and infant mortality was still quite high. So lots of people encountered death among their siblings, and not only of their parents, but with their siblings because of child mortality. And um, also, in, in other cultures, like when I lived in India, when, when people die, you actually see the body. You know, the body is carried on a bier to the funeral, funeral pyre uh, and is then buried. Whereas uh, in our culture, the body is whisked away to an undertaker's place. And then most funerals in England, the coffin's in a sealed box. Whereas in, even in other Christian traditions, like the Orthodox, like the Russian Orthodox, um, the coffin is open and people file past and pay their respects to the, they see the dead body. And when I've seen dead bodies, it's had a most powerful effect on me because, you know, you know the person's dead when you've seen them. Uh, whereas seeing a, a, a screwed up coffin in a funeral service, it, you don't get the same immediate hit. I once again went to a talk by Anthony Bloom, who was the Russian Orthodox um, Archbishop in London, um, and he, he called Death and Children. And he pointed out that in the Orthodox tradition, um, they make a big point of involving children in the process of death, and they get to see the dead body, and they get to be part of the process of the people dying and the funeral rites. Um, whereas he pointed out that in the West, people often feel they're protecting children by shielding them from seeing dead bodies, by not talking about death, by pretending people have just gone away or something, and not letting them be part of that transitional process in, involved with the preparing the body for burial or cremation and uh, the funeral uh, rites. And I must say that I found his talk enormously helpful. And with my own children, as they were growing up, we had one occasion when someone who lived in our house died and um, we all went to see his body. And uh, I think it was very powerful for all of us to, to see that and to realize that. Whereas in, in, in otherwise in our culture, First of all, people die less often because there's much less infant mortality and death rates are much reduced owing to modern medicine, which of course is a good thing. Um, but it does mean that there's been this veil of secrecy drawn over death and lots of people in Britain today have never seen a dead body. Whereas when I lived, I'd seen one or two dead bodies before I went to live in India, but when I was in, in India, I saw quite a lot. And uh, that's normal in India, for, and in many cultures it's normal for people to be aware of the process of death and to be part of that rite of passage, uh, the funerary rites uh, when someone dies and they're sent on their journey. Um, it's very much more open. 
And I think that's one thing that we could fairly easily do in our culture is to just make it easier for children to be part of these, include children more in uh, the process of death and dying and funerals. Yeah, I mean, I, in one way, I, um, I think that that is something that would be easy to do, because in some ways, all it requires is for people to um, be present at death or to see bodies after death and so on. Um, but it's it's at the same time, it's it, it would be, I think, a huge um, cultural shift, um, because I think what it is asking us is to consider that a good death is part of a good life um, and that there's a kind of beauty in death and stillness in death, you know, which I know as well when I was a, a priest, um, I was with people who died and, and saw dead bodies and so on around funerals. Um, and then in my own personal life as well, I was particularly um, present with my mother when she died. Um, and it, it's the kind of thing which you can only really learn by undergoing the experience. You can describe it and say it and people might get it or they might not. But um, I think it's partly because of all that you go through. So it's not like my mother's death was um, sort of seamless and effortless and peaceful all the way through quite the opposite. She had a cancer, you know, which killed her too young. And, um, you know, we, we wish she wished this wasn't so and went through a lot of treatments and the agony the ups and downs of that not knowing what was going to happen and not happen and all the rest of it um but it was that reality that when it came to the end and she really was dying um clear almost cleared a kind of different terrain it was almost like we entered a different space and because she um became peaceful and accepted what was happening um, and kind of almost, I think, um, radiated a life beyond her own life towards the end, um, because we were we were sort of all there as, you know, it's a very intense experience often, but it takes you into a different kind of quality of time almost. Um, maybe because at some level you realize you're participating in these rhythms which are shared by everybody, but also you're you're coming closer and closer to the mystery of life itself. You know, you it's very hard to experience it as just a kind of biological mechanism that somehow is shutting down because you realize that someone who you know and you know knowing your own soul their soul is shifting and changing that was very much my experience that um, in the last day or two particularly it was like she was here but also already half in another place as well and then there's this experience which people do describe quite routinely that to be with someone when they die is like they've moved on, not that they've just switched off um, as if, you know, they, the car's been turned off and the key's been taken out of the, um, mm. uh, you know, the lock, as it were, and so on. Um, it, but you can only know that when you have been with it. Um, I mean, another experience which, which I have, which um, resonates with me very powerfully is um, actually during um, the last year, my partner um, had a stroke. Um, and it turned out that it was a micro stroke. And so actually um, it became quite clear that that was the case. And so, um, you know, that was a huge relief. Um, but when it was happening, we didn't know that. And it was kind of like an experience that happened at two levels. At one level, you know, we called 999 and, you know, hooray for the NHS and all they do because it, the, the ambulance came very quickly and so on. And, um, the good thing about having a stroke is that the pathway in hospitals is very clearly understood and so you're very quickly um, you're in you have scans and so on and, and people work out what's going on um but at the same time there was this spiritual process going on which was is this going to be the last day we see each other i couldn't get into the ambulance because it was mid-covid um so there was a sense of separation um and yet in that moment which i could only know in that moment as well i I both, I, we both, because we shared this afterwards, had this sense that there's something that is shared between us that can never die. In fact, now it would, you know, you might call it the love that's between us that um, has become so established in us through a long-term relationship that it sort of becomes part of you, um, regardless whether you're with the person or not. But it also, for me, carried this intimation that, again, our love and relating and communion, if you like was part of a much broader love relating communion life 
of which deaths are part, but I felt in that moment, of, which was one of, one of panic and, and, and gratitude that the ambulance was there as well, it was both, and was this sense that, my goodness, I've touched something that is eternal here in this experience. You know, that would be another word for it. Not that it goes on and on forever um, in a sort of timeless sense, but that touches us almost like a vertical experience of life and death, which mm -hmm. you can only have when you come to those moments. Uh, what is often, I, maybe that's not quite true because I think you can actually experience, as it were, the little deaths by becoming more and more alert to how life actually, even every moment is a kind of receiving and letting go which you know wisdom traditions would encourage us to foster but certainly when you have those big moments they can be a very revelatory as well as moving and so on mm. i think one of the good things about contemporary research is that there are no people best known being in britain probably as peter fenwick who are doing research on events around dying um instead of trying to sweep it under the carpet, actually observing what happens. And this is with the help of people who work in hospices and nurses and others. And there are patterns that emerge and quite often people in the last two or three days start behaving as if they're seeing hidden presences, people or beings that other people can't see. Um, sometimes they talk of their people they knew and who are now dead or sometimes angels or spirit beings. Um, but it's clear there's a kind of transition process going on. And in the most extreme forms, this takes uh, uh, the form of what's called terminal lucidity, where people who may have had Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia for many years um, in the last few days become able to recognize other people to know what's going on to talk about things that happened years before um, and they, it's as if they, they, their memory comes back and there's a kind of collecting of themselves preparing themselves for this transition and as a matter of fact this is something i'm doing research on at the moment in relation to animals as you know, I've been doing research on unexplained powers of animals for many years, and my assistant Pam Smart and I have a huge database with more than 6,000 stories about um, unexplained abilities of animals. And one of the things we've recently been doing is looking through stories surrounding the death of dogs, cats, and other pets. Um, I, I was interested to do this to see whether terminal lucidity is a biological phenomenon, whether animals that know when they're going to die undergo a kind of transition and whether this human transitional process is purely human or whether it's part of a wider biological process. There are many stories about animals knowing when they're going to die, you know, going out to cats, going out to die in, in, in sort of away from their house and uh, as if animals know when they're going to die. Um, and we've been looking at stories that suggest that some animals do undergo a kind of terminal lucidity. And there's one story of a very sick dog um, that, you know, had been just lying there fairly helpless and they decided the time had come for the dog to be put down by a vet. And, uh, and, and then, to the whole family's surprise, the dog got up, hadn't got up for a long time and went round, they were sitting around the dining table, and it went round to each member of the family and raised its paw, and as it were, to say goodbye, and then went back and lay down on its mat and died. So, stories like that, you see, suggest that there's something in this process that is not just humans, but also other, at least mammals, um, uh, have this ability. It actually there's one case of a budgerigar, so this may be with birds as well. Uh, incidentally, we're trying to collect more stories about this at the moment, so if anyone's listening to us now who has a story about a dog or a cat or a budgie or a parrot or a horse or any other animal they were close to uh, uh, behaving in an in unusual and interesting way shortly before it died, do please write and let me know. You can write to me uh, through my website, uh, sheldrake.org. Um, so I, I think that there, there's a process, and I think this process obviously takes time, but some people can't undergo it. 
And I think that's one reason in the litany for Ash Wednesday, there's one of the prayers is, deliver us, good Lord, from sudden death. And if you die suddenly by being murdered or in a car crash or a plane crash or something, you don't have time to go through this preparation process that someone who's dying of an illness or of simply of old age does. There's a time to prepare. And I suppose one lesson from that is that we ought to be prepared at all times because no one knows when they're going to die and any of us could die any time uh, for all sorts of accidental reasons, not just health reasons. Yeah, well, the, you, you, the story of pets reminds me of um, the experience which we had with our cats. So we had two cats and they were, you know, they were older, but not particularly elderly. Um, but one of them died and the other cat who had known they'd known each other since birth um, immediately stopped eating and drinking it was quite striking that um, you know within two or three hours I realized that um, she'd stopped eating and drinking and never ate and drank again and died herself four days later um, and you know in, in the human context you'd say the, they died of a broken heart um, I actually understand that with cats um, it's the liver that that malfunctions and when cats don't uh, eat and drink. Um, and so that's what is, as it were, the toxicity that caused the death. Um, but, you know, she died because she realized that half of her had gone, I think. And whilst, um, you know, she would sit on our laps and, and be comforted in a way, um, she, well, I think not just knew that the other cat had died, but had felt that half of her had died and it was now time to go, actually. Um, there wasn't much sign of distress in her, but there was a set, definitely a sign of following. Um, and, um, you know, again, it was this very profound experience of, of how life pulls us from death, even in this case with the cats. Um, and, you know, I, if someone had described that story to me, I would have thought well, that's sweet, but, you know, um, maybe it's just the emotion of the moment, but it was a very profound moment as well, which, you know, people can have with, their animals in their lives as much as with the other humans in their lives too. Um, you know, I, I think the rehearsal of these stories is so important because, you know, we do live in a culture, not just medically, but in so many ways, doesn't know what to do about death. You know, the whole story of our economy is one now of recovery and growth again, you know, as if we can kind of get back to how we were two years ago, almost as if nothing's happened with the COVID crisis or, you know, so much of our own personal financial lives. It's about securing the future through mortgages, through insurance, as if we can offset anything that might happen in principle, if only we have enough financial products. Um, you know, so it's in all sorts of ways, actually, I think our culture does distance us from death. Um, you know, and then if you get into this, you read the stories about, as you were alluding to at the beginning, the singularity hope that somehow we'll be able to sort of download ourselves onto a computer and avoid death in that way. And, you know, this is the serious money um, and power going into these pursuits through organizations like Google. These aren't marginal concerns. Mm. So, you know, this, this for me, going back to where I started, you know, hearing what these doctors were talking about, I do feel it's a really crucial area if we're going to try and learn from what's happening with COVID and not just sweep it under the carpet and sort of pretend that we can get back to so-called normal. Um, you know, maybe it can be one of the, um, you know, the, even the blessings um, which the experience uh, can offer us in a way because of the pain, not in spite of the pain, but because of all the difficulty. It's almost like a prompt to our culture to say, look, you've got this a bit out of sync, whatever else is going wrong. Um, and but there is a different way to think about this. And, you know, and as you're saying, as well, I think we're saying there are resources we can draw on um, and they're actually nearby. They're not actually so far, but we do have to kind of want them and turn to them as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. OK, well, that, that feels a good point to pause. And uh, thank you very yeah. much. Well, we've left several issues. You know, what happens after death, which we've discussed before. Um, you know, rites of passage for death, you know, and which all cultures have and their importance. These are all other topics, but I'm very glad we've had a chance to explore this one in, in such a broad context. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you.